Welcome. We're here at the Harvard University Center for Governmental and International Studies to welcome Roy Freed, whom I met by sheer chance at a seminar given by Avram Agoff. Unfortunately, about five minutes before the seminar was to begin, we lost power and were suddenly in pitch dark and sitting there for, oh, 20 minutes, a half an hour, Roy, something like that. And then the lady came in and announced that we weren't going to get power anytime soon. And just as everyone, everyone was about to leave, Roy asks, stands up and asks everyone to in, remain in the dark, in the dark <laughs> and proceeds to talk for, oh, 10 minutes or so. That's right. And I found it to be very interesting. And uh, so when it was, unfortunately, I couldn't film it because there was no light, <laughs> such it was. But nevertheless, he got a round of applause at the conclusion of his talk. People did not leave. They listened to him. And I found that interesting, the fact that you were able to hold people after they had been sitting in the dark that That's long. That's right. That was amazing. And you held my attention. So I stopped you on the way out, and I thought it would be a great idea for us at some point to have this conversation. So I welcome you, Roy, uh, and uh, uh, I would like you to uh, uh, speak. I remember you speaking about your experience with Avram, you and your wife's experience with Avram, and could you could you take it from there? Oh, so, <coughs> well, thank you very much, uh, Osman. I'm delighted to know you, and I'd like to welcome the audience to this uh, recording. Uh, I, and um, I'm 96 years old. I am fortunate, I think, to uh, be blessed with a fairly good mind and memory. I agree. And so it's a joy to draw on that memory. Uh, my story is fascinating, but I must say that uh, credit for this opportunity really goes to my late wife, who died about a year ago. Uh, she was a very resourceful young woman. Uh, she went to Connecticut College for Women uh, in the late 1930s and uh, when she was there she learned that there were two scholarships for students to go to an international summer school in Geneva. Uh, she had uh, parents who were immigrants and uh, her mother was terribly overprotective and uh, very unwilling to have Anne go to Geneva alone at that time in the 30s. But Anne was determined, fortunately, and that's the basis for our being together, uh, because there at the International Summer School, which was just um, before the Second World War, uh, the, there were uh, students from uh, 29 countries. There were 56 students. And uh, fortunately, there was one who was a young Bulgarian woman. Her name was Novena Zelyaskova. And Anne found it interesting to meet a lot of the students, but somehow our story depends upon her having befriended Novena. Uh, uh, Novena came to this country for a short period. She was studying biology. And uh, during that stay, uh, when I became friends with her, she uh, befriended some Bulgarians in Detroit who turned out to be uh, ardent Marxists. And uh, she became interested in the humanitarian aspects of Marxism. And uh, when she returned to Bulgaria, uh, she tried to become in, a member of the Communist Party, uh, but they wouldn't accept her because she was infected by being in America. But um, anyhow, uh, she and Anne were uh, ardent uh, correspondents by postal mail, and uh, so your your Anne was still in my wife. Europe. No, here. Well, she was here too. Oh yeah, Anne returned immediately after the summer. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. She came back to see me. Okay. And okay. I became, so you were here. Okay. I, and I became a friend of. Were you Anne. married at the time? Or? Oh yeah. Okay. Wait a minute. Were we? No, I married in. A, 1940. You're right. I'm just a boyfriend. Okay. But it was good. Okay. Okay. <laughs> it was a good start. And um, so they corresponded by postal mail uh, actively. And uh, in, uh, I was working as a lawyer for the United States government, the Antitrust Division. 
and she was involved with the Communist Party as helping him as a translator. Now, may I ask you, what was the Antitrust Division? I've never heard of that. Oh, oh, it's the, um, the unit of the, the uh, Justice Department that is supposed to protect America from monopolies. It's the anti-monopoly oh, okay. uh, enforcer. Yes, yes. And so I was a litigator then with, uh, with them. And um, at that time, uh, I was working on a very major case here in Boston uh, when this... What was that, may I ask? Uh, it was against the United Shoe Machinery Company, which had a monopoly over the manufacture and distribution of machines for making shoes. And it had a complete monopoly, and uh, we had a good case, and the result was it was broken up. Okay. Uh, now, um, so we decided that uh, in each end that we would stop corresponding because the that correspondence with the, our pictorial stamps could be, turn to, out to be embarrassing. And that was um, about 1950. And uh, so when we did that, uh, as I look back, uh, then it was uh, reasonable for us to expect that we had lost contact because we were corresponding by postal mail and there would be no way to find each other. Uh, it wasn't as easy as now where we have the internet. Right. With Novena. What? The losing contact with Novena? Novena. Novena, Novena. sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and so that was it. Well, as time went on, um, the, our story moves to 1985 abruptly. Uh, at, uh, that aspect of the story relates to two other members, uh, students at that school. Uh, they were Robert Newman, who was an Aus Austrian um, student then uh, from Vienna, and Marlon Eldridge, and they married. And Robert uh, was helped to come to the United States uh, from that uh, school by the Americans. They helped him come first to go to Amherst as an undergraduate, although he already had a doctorate in Austria. And then he went to Yale and got a doctorate here in international relations. And we um, reestablished contact uh, with uh, Robert. Now, uh, in 1985, by sheer chance, he and Marlin and he, oh, he then was the ambassador to Saudi Arabia. I should, I'm jumping too fast. That's all right. Um, when he uh, got his doctorate, he was decidedly uh, knowledgeable about international relations, and he became the uh, advisor on international relations to Nixon and then Johnson, President Nixon and Johnson. And through that, uh, that association, he first became ambassador to Morocco, and then to Afghanistan, and then to Saudi Arabia. So in 1985, he was ambassador to Saudi Arabia from the United States, with Marlon was there with him. And uh, for some unknown reason, he had a falling out with Richard Allen, who was advisor to, to uh, President Reagan. And because of that, he had to resign his post in Saudi Arabia and return to the United States. Politics. As they say, Marlon got a severe diplomatic illness. <laughs> and uh, so um, they were, um, well, by chance, this is the key point to the whole story, by chance they found an old issue of Life magazine in which there was a letter to the editor from Novena Zelyaskova. Novena loved to write letters to the editor. And from the editor, they got her address in Sofia, Bulgaria. Who would have thought? Nobody. I mean, it, it, whenever I tell the story, I, I'm amazed that I, it's there to tell. Well, they wrote to the editor, got her address in Sofia, and they were going to travel back from Saudi Arabia eventually on the Orient Express, that old famous railroad which went through Sofia, Bulgaria. And so they wrote to Novena and arranged for her to meet them at the railroad station in Sofia, which she did. 
and there she brought with her them with herself to them a letter to Anne, which of course lacked an address, but they had our address because Anne was a correspondent with many people, her friends from the school. And um, with that address, we then corresponded with Novena and arranged that, we got that letter in 1986, we arranged that in 1987 we were going to go to Zurich, we decided to go on to Sofia to see Novena. So, after many decades, we were able to reestablish contact with Novena. That and must have been a special moment. Oh, it was fantastic. It was June 1987, and there we walked into her apartment, and uh, it was wonderful. Yeah, and, and we established a contact that continued until she died. Um, and when was this? What? When was that? I don't know, but a number of years later, but okay. it will sort of come out as I tell you what happened. Well, there we were in June 1987 with Novena. Uh, she immediately had friends uh, to her apartment. We met a number of her friends who are still our friend. A number of them are still our friends. And, uh, but on June 1987, uh, during the day, Anne and I went for a walk in downtown Sofia. Uh, neither of us could read the Cyrillic alphabet yet. And we were walking on a main street in front of a very large white building with uh, Greek uh, revival columns. And uh, there was a door at the very middle of it on the first floor into it, through which people were walking in and out actively. And uh, Anne and I had no idea what the building was, but we were curious and we thought, you know, you're, many buildings you walk and look in and see. Maybe it was an art museum. Well, we stepped over the threshold and the man at the door during communism said to us in English, you can't come in, this is only for students. Well, Anne started to argue with him and Anne was very diminutive then. <laughs> and she stood up to her full height of five feet and, and said, but I'm a professor, doesn't that entitle us to come into this building? And um, uh, it was the, the National uh, Library, and he said, no, this is only for students. Well, we turned around and walked out, and we got to the sidewalk on Admiral Tobuchin Boulevard, and a young man with a white shirt, a short young man, I'll never forget him, came running after us, and without introducing himself, he said, you obviously are foreign visitors. You should have been invited to the National Library, which was correct. Well, that attracted to us, us to him, and we arranged to have breakfast with him. Well, in the course of a few breakfasts, he asked us if we had any idea of how he might be able to go to the United States to study. He then was a graduate student in philosophy, which is a popular topic for Bulgarians. Mm -hmm. And um, all I could think of was the possibility of funding with a Fulbright. And even though there was communism in Bulgaria, the Pro Fulbright program was operating, but only for the communist nomenclatura, and he wasn't in that group. Well, I knew that he had to apply in Bulgaria, <coughs> and in which case he didn't stand a chance, but I forgot. So <coughs> instead of short-circuiting <coughs> this uh, activity, I, when we returned, I called the Fulbright office in Washington, and I spoke to some unknown man, and um, I told him uh, of Latko NF's interest in it. Uh, and uh, he immediately said, well, he'd have to apply in Bulgaria, which short-circuited the whole thing, except he continued to talk to me, and he said, well, who are you, and why are you interested in Bulgaria? I said to him, well, I'm a retired lawyer and I made a social visit to Bulgaria. And he immediately said, well, why don't you apply for a Fulbright to go to Bulgaria? Well, Ann and I applied and we got Fulbrights to, in Bulgaria for May and June 1989. And there we... Another by chance. The, my whole life is by chance. <laughs> I mean, you can't count them. They're, they're countless and wonderful. I mean, I had the most illustrious life and Anne did too. Well, anyhow, we got here and reestablished contact with Zlatko NF, the student. 
Zlatko, by the way, means golden. It's like the uh, Polish term zloty for money. Okay. And uh, and it, it's amazing how Zlatko's parents were prescient to name him golden. <laughs> <laughs> Truly golden. We're still close friends with him by email. Oh, great. Yeah, it, it's wonderful. And anyhow, Is he still in Bulgaria? No, he's in B Berlin. I see. I was going to get to that. Okay, well, <laughs> but, but, uh, go ahead. But, um, but it turned out that um, Avram Agov was his roommate. Ah, and so it was okay. natural for us to meet Avram. Okay, so this and, is how we come to Avram. Yeah, Avram okay. uh, was then a student, uh, as was uh, Zlatko. And by uh, interesting... Well, where, where was this? In Bulgaria, in Sofia. And still in Sofia. Yeah. Okay. And, and Avram decided to apply to a, uh, an interesting uh, young group of social scientists who were advisors to the Politburo of the Communist Party. Wow. <laughs> but they turned out to be very bright, open-minded people. And um, uh, Avram told them of beating us. And by coincidence, at that point, late in communism, but we didn't know it was close to the end, they were interested in trying to establish contacts with American scholars. And here are some Americans, they thought, well, maybe we could be a bridge to American scholars, which wasn't true. We, we, it, we didn't really have contact with them, but it didn't matter. Let me ask you, before this, this time, uh, was, was there a, a, a feeling of, uh, you know, we're Americans, uh, we're in Bulgaria, and they may, but they may not welcome us here because we're Oh, not no, Chinese. not at all. Never had anything like that. It was quite, quite open by that Yeah, time. we never were contacted by the CIA and uh, nothing like no that. No problems with the United no, States no, government. No, nothing at all. Yeah. Uh, but the, um, the leader of that group, um, Adnan Shentov, approached us and uh, said he, he wanted to meet be, become friends with us. And, and uh, this was the member of the Politburo? Yeah, he right. was the okay. head of that advisory committee, okay. social science mm -hmm. committee. And we met on a park bench on um, uh, Boulevard Ruski, then for Russia, okay. downtown in Sofia. I never will forget that. There was a little corner park and we sat on a bench <laughs> and and got to know each other, and then we moved across the street to the second floor to a cafe, and we sat right in the window, <laughs> and we uh, we became uh, friends. It was wonderful, and um, he introduced us to his colleagues, and we became friends with them, and we established a very ongoing social relationship. We would have meetings with them, discussion, friendship, we'd, we'd picnics, things like that. Uh, and a few times they had us driven in a black Volga of the Communist Party by oh. kamikaze driver. Ah. <laughs> it was quite an experience. Yeah. Well, uh, at that time, um, there was a um, wonderful ambassador here from the United States, Sal Polanski. And because we were Fulbrighters, it became natural for us to befriend him and then his wife. And um, so, uh, to, to sort of bring things short, uh, we were able, by that common friendship, to arrange for him to have lunch with people from the, that group in the uh, Politburo at the uh, American Embassy residence, which was a, uh, an uh, unusual event. Before that, the ambassador had not been able to meet anybody below the formal top ministry level. And we attended that lunch, and it was an exciting experience of open interchange of discussion in um, October of 1989. We had no idea then that that was just before the uh, turn of events where uh, uh, the uh, Bulgarian communist people resigned and it became a democracy overnight. And. Um, and Avram turned out to be the catalyst for that momentous event. And uh, uh, 
we uh, became very friendly with Avram, and uh, he had a, uh, a woman friend, uh, Marina Canetti, and they married, and we attended the wedding at a hotel in uh, 1989 in Sofia. And we became friends with Marina's uh, mother and father and grandmother. Mm -hmm. The grandmother of all people was Chinese, oh, wow. which is a story in itself. Right. Sun Fan Canetti um, met her husband at Kweyan, a Red Cross camp near the uh, Thailand during the war uh, with the uh, uh, Mao Tse Tung and uh, by Mao Tse Tung against Chiang Kai-shek. Uh, fa Father uh, Kennedy, I don't remember his first name, was a radiologist and a communist. And he had been a doctor for the um, uh, Republican Army in the Spanish War. I see. And when Franco won, he and his colleagues had to leave and they went to a refugee camp in southern France. And from there, he, he couldn't return to Bulgaria because he was a communist, and at that time, there was a, a monarchy. So he had to go to that camp, and he was recruited with others to go to that Red Cross camp in China. And his wife-to-be, Sun Fan, wanted help to serve the Red Cross, and she had hoped to be a doctor, as his fa her father was, but it was too late, so she became a nurse there, and they met uh, there at the camp and married. And they had a child who was the father of uh, Marina Kennedy. Okay, okay. So um, then we, um, when, uh, when uh, democracy came to Bulgaria, uh, Avram's desire from the very beginning to become interested in Korea was changed from North Korea, which would be natural then, to South Korea. And so that's when he uh, became interested. And he uh, got a, a doctorate uh, opportunity to study for a doctorate at Columbia. And the family came to uh, New York, but he found it, it not sufficiently attractive at Columbia. So he was able to switch to Harvard, and we were, so the family up here in Harvard. And at Harvard, the requirement was that he learn a, an East Asian language. And obviously, he decided to learn Korean, and he got an opportunity for a scholarship there, to go there, and he went there. And uh, he, um, he had a roommate, that he found a place to live with a Korean. So everybody's come from Sofia back to the United States while well, this is your back. Oh yeah, we're back. We're back in, yeah. By that time, you see, um, our Fulbright was so successful, Ann and I, my wife, networked extremely well, and we accumulated a ton of Bulgarian friends in Sofia. They're wonderfully warm people, they're family oriented, they're bright, and um, so we developed this coterie of, of close friends. And it turned out that uh, each time our um, activities in Bulgaria were supposed to end, you know, like the Fulbright, well, we, we met in the event in 1987 for two weeks. Uh, but um, then uh, in the, the course of that meeting, it, it turned out we were applied for a, a Fulbright. And so we came in 1988 to make arrangements for the Fulbright in 1989. And then when the Fulbright 1989, it turned out that I had um, an invitation to teach of all places in Shanghai in October 1988. And what were you teaching? American law. Okay. And uh, so in 1989, the uh, Tiananmen a square incident had occurred, yes. and so my um, invitation for October 1989 turned out to be not, not desirable. We were concerned of embarrassing our Chinese friends by being here as Americans, so we decided to say, well, we'll go back to Bulgaria <laughs> without knowing what we might do. But Anne 
was an outstanding um, professor of um, clinical social work, and she introduced psychodynamic psychology to the Bulgarians. Uh, now, for those of us who don't know what that is. Modern American psychology, cognitive psychology, in contrast, and that's the important in contrast to the Marxist psychology, okay. which, the inf which looked at the influence of society on people. I mean, it was very superficial. Mm -hmm. And so Anne was very attractive to the Bulgarians. They flocked around her and they were so eager to learn, and she had large classes uh, at Sophie University. Okay. And so it started to develop its relationship. Now, what was so interesting was that in uh, November 1989, uh, unexpectedly for everybody, the Communist Party resigned. Uh, and um, Ambassador Polanski in 1990 got funds to enable Bulgarians to come to make visits to the United States. Which they probably hadn't had that before. No, of course the not. Communist Oh, no. They allow people to travel much, or no, not well. No, couldn't, no, they no. couldn't leave Bulgaria. It was, it was at all. difficult to get out of Bulgaria. Yeah. One of the men in the communist social science group was George Prohaski, whom we befriended in his socializing. And one day in 1990, we get a call. Who was he? He was a, a economist okay. with that. Social science group. Uh, okay. We befriended. That your, that your wife was teaching. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so he calls us in Boston, and he says, "I'm in Boston. I'm a group leader for one of those tours to the United States." <laughs> he hadn't informed us in advance, and so he said, "Well, come over and visit us." We were then living at Coolidge Corner in Brookline, and he came, and he brought with him uh, a. Um, Psychiatrist Toma, Tomov, who was a modern psychiatrist interested in Freudian uh, psychotherapy, things like that. And we're sitting in our living room, and when uh, Toma learned that Anne was a uh, professor of clinical social work, he said, I happen to have a contract with the prison system in Bulgaria to teach prison social workers how to interview their clients. Well, it turned out the clients were practically all Roma or Gypsy, and it turned out that the social workers were former engineers and everything but a social worker. And he says to Ann, would you be interested in coming to teach that course? Well, Ann, of course, said yes. And she said, but in teaching it, uh, I will not just teach those pe pe social workers I want the course open to outsiders. And that was a stroke of genius. So she had two sessions. And in the open session... This is still at Sophia University? Well, no, this was just in Sophia. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Toma found a place. And they met. Okay. Okay. And um, in the uh, students was um, Galina Markova. Galina then was a high school teacher. But she happened to have a wonderful brain. Oh, and she was uh, so obvious in that class with the questions she asked and the comments she made that Ann said to Toma, you must set up a school of clinical social work in Sofia, and you must invite Galena to be the first student, which she did. Mm -hmm. And Galena attended and took an active role and then Toma presumed to be the director. And Ann at one point shortly after that said, why don't you have Galena be the director? Which she did. And Galena turned out to be an absolute genius. We're still in contact with her. We became just enthralled with our friendship and um, we helped her get a doctorate from Smith Social Work School in Northampton, which I she see. did. She had a terrible time getting accepted in Bulgaria because of the rigidity of the European system. Uh, they had no uh, clinical social workers there. 
to form a committee to determine if she was qualified. Ah. <laughs> so <clears throat> she was serving in that capacity, but without the validation for a number of years. It was ridiculous. But Galena became a leading social work uh, figure in, in Bulgaria. And when uh, Bulgaria joined the European Union uh, and started to influence the social programs in Bulgaria, Galena is playing a major role. For example, the European Union decided properly that Bulgaria <coughs> should abandon its uh, orphanages, which were terrible, just terrible. They were in remote areas with, uh, with no stimulation for the, the orphans, things like that. And Galena became the person who took responsibility for making that switch. Making that transition to... To, uh, yeah, yeah, to um, adoptions and foster homes, okay. uh, the American style. Okay. And she, she's such an important figure there. I mean, she, she, it's actually unbelievable how... We sort of went through that here in this country, right? We used to have oh, yeah, they were really modeling after the United States. Okay. Uh, and. Um, it, a revolution in, in uh, enabling the uh, orphanage children, many of whom were, were or, um, Roma or gypsies, right. okay. uh, make a, uh, a really good transition to a modern society. The, um, and uh, now uh, Galena is uh, playing a major role in a card program that's very interesting uh, in Europe, throughout, almost throughout Europe, to um, uh, overcome the, uh, what they call the discrimination against the Roma or Gypsy people. It's going on. recent events in France in yeah. regards to that. Yeah, yes. it's very important. Yes. Now. And so Galena is playing a major role in, in that activity. And it's interesting that here at Harvard, I attended a day long program on that general effort. And so I, I became excited about this because. Um, on the Smith College campus one summer, I met a Roma man who was a professor of psychology. I'm on the campus and I see this man and he's you know, wearing regular clothes, a slightly dark tinged face and for some reason I did what I usually do and said, who are you? <laughs> and it turns out it was Risto Kuchikov which was his Bulgarian name, and he was a Roma. And ordinarily, the Roma families discourage education, but somehow he Why was... Why is that? That was their culture. Their culture was very offensive to the outside community. They had very large families. They disdained education. Uh, they disdained contact with, uh, with the outsiders. They lived in, in slums. It was terrible. During communism, the Roma at least had income, presumably for work. But after communism, they didn't have that They're income unless own. they could scrounge a job. And they became pickpockets and, uh, and things like that. So this current move now, um, which I learned about at the Center for European Studies, is very important. And Galena is playing a major role in that. Uh, this so is she's she's sort of forming a, a transition for the Roma. Yeah, she has a group. She got funding from uh, a northern European country. I don't remember in Scandinavia. I think uh, quite a large sum of money to fund with a staff and a program and things like that. So what more can I tell you? All I can say is this: that fortunately. Uh, the Bulgarian people, as I said, are, are very uh, warm and friendly. I agree and with they, you. And they have become our family. And when Anne was alive, there was a family to both of us. That's wonderful. I'm not fortunate to have a close, warm, embracing family. Um, and so for both of us, it's been a major factor in our lives. They were it. Yes, there's a large population here in Boston, and they're very uh, advanced uh, professionally and in business, and um, they're very friendly and warm, and uh, they've been very important for both of us, and now especially for me alone. And my becoming impressed with that group 
moved me to suggest to them that they organize as a recognized community, which they decided to do, and it's called the Roy Freed Project. That's here in Boston? Here in Boston. And what they've done is they've organized in the most professional way and uh, to arrange for incorporation, to acquire a building to serve as their school, their weekend school and their church, and site for cultural activities. And uh, they're continuing now with, with a very active fundraising program. So it, it's exciting how how it's evolved. How it all started through the end meeting in Vienna, insisting on going to Bulgaria. I see. And yes. here it becomes so my life. This whole chain of events. Yeah, and yeah. and but so wonderful is because Ann and I have had a long, deep interest in helping people. I mean, people have helped us. I mean, it's been mutual. Uh, Ann, for example, started out as a protege to a wonderful high school professor who really insisted that instead of becoming a teacher, she should get a full profession. And, and George Davis, I'll never forget him, and she told me about him so well. So it's interesting, the sweep of experience, uh, which um, has been wonderful for us. And I think that my telling you about it should be recognized to be an example of what opportunities are out there for people especially as people get much older. Very and, true. And um, it, it just, it's just beyond imagination what this has meant to us and to the, so many people we've interacted with. Well, can you talk a little bit about your involvement with uh, Canton uh, Community Television? Oh, well, uh, yes. That's fascinating. I have a very dear friend, um, Nava Vogel. It turns out that Nava Vogel's mother was a Bulgarian ah. Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> it continues. <laughs> and but Nava is a social worker, and she has a master's degree in public health from Harvard. And uh, my wife and I have been very friendly with her, the social work contact, and also on a personal basis. And she was asked by, um, what's her name, the uh, Ann Hartstein, the Secretary of Elder Affairs in Massachusetts, to set up a, uh, a video interview between Ann and three people. And uh, Nava picked me and a woman who is a retired nurse who goes to the senior center she manages in Belmont and takes blood pressure readings, and um, somebody else. I just can't remember right now my wonderful okay. memory, <laughs> but it doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Because it was done in Belmont, by the Belmont unit of community TV. Okay. And I found it fascinating so I asked the Belmont people if they would enable me to conduct interviews there. But because they're regional, they said, no, you can't come here, you live in Canton. But they gave me the address of the director of the Canton unit, Tanya Willow. And I met Tanya, and Tanya turned out to be the most receptive, bright, astonishing young woman you can imagine. How long ago was this? A few years ago. Yeah, number maybe. So well, you've been doing this for quite a while. Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. And Tanya set up the Roy Free Show of interviews, and I picked the interviewees. And is this a weekly show? No, intermittently. Here and there. At, at and least turn up, yeah. As I move, because I'm so very busy that it's a matter of fitting the puzzle together. One of the uh, I interviewed the uh, last. Um, former uh, principal of Canton High School, a uh, man of remote Portuguese background, which is completely irrelevant. And it was such an interesting interview because he was not an educator, he was an engineer. And he, uh, his first activity was working on an oil tanker going to Alaska. <laughs> <laughs> and then he was a participating in the, the design of the atomic submarines at Groton. Oh, yes. And then he got the urge to want to teach. 
So he went to BC and became a teacher. And then he wanted to advance, so he became an administrator, a principal. And um, he was just fantastic because he was of the community, the very diverse community in, in that area. I mean, uh, middle class, a lot of working people, things like that. He was ideal. I had a wonderful interview with him. It was just beautiful. And um, then uh, I had a lot of interviews, but one in particular that I like to talk about is this. Ann and I were Fulbrighters. And when we returned from Bulgaria, and I learned there was no Fulbright chapter here in Boston, one in name only, I found it a real chapter here. Uh, which is very active. It's one of the most active chapters in the country. You have tons of foreign Fulbrighters coming here. So because of our interest and enthusiasm for the Fulbright program, Anne and I would go annually to the opening reception for foreign Fulbrighters arriving in Boston in late September. Ten years ago, we went to one at Northeastern. Northeastern has been very supportive of that activity. And um, we sat down at a table with two men, two young men, and they were from Iraq. One of them was a Kurd who was a teacher, and he uh, was at the uh, Boston University, um, Mass, UMass Boston, okay, uh, in American literature. And he had been here only six years. He, he had known English only six years, and he was winning awards for writing in prose and poetry. It was amazing. And I'm still in touch with him. He went back to Kurdistan. But the other one was um, Ahmad Hadidi, a physician. And there, in a European style, you become a physician very young. You go into medicine right from high school. So he was very young. And he was here at... Um, Boston University uh, School of Public Health, and uh, he was able to, ordinarily the Fulbrighters have to return, or they can't apply for a um, visa here for two years after finishing their work, they have to return. I see. But Ahmad was able to stay here because he came from Mosul. And Mosul was terribly violent at that time, and probably still I remember that. Yes. And he was in jeopardy of being killed if he went back because of his American connection. So he got um, refugee status here. He became a citizen last week. Fantastic. <laughs> yeah. And um, well, he turns out to be the most amazing, open-minded person you can imagine. He's. he's he, uh, he's so dubious about religion and, and so much interested in interactions among people and, and, and he's such a deep thinker. Uh, I've been particularly active since retirement in thinking about the human mind as um, a, an animate uh, autonomous uh, machine, uh, an, very broadly analogous to a computer because of the way uh, evolution created the mind with the electrical circuitry and the neuronal uh, pulse signals that represent facts and information. And so he, he loves to talk with me about my novel concept of the mechanical functional nature of the human mind. And I've been interviewing him a number of times. The people are enthralled with him. He's so open, he's so, he's so warm and so, so convinced it, it's a model. I'm going to interview him on Saturday again. And at this interview, I'm interested in exploring what he's all about because here he is, an Arab. Well, what is an Arab? <laughs> you wouldn't. <laughs> See an Arab who said him in the street, you know what I mean? He's just another person. Right. And also what the attractions are of Islam to people and how they can be both positive and negative and things of that sort. To get insights from his side of, of the uh, table. Interesting. Right? 
So that's what I'm doing in retirement. Is I'm uh, I write articles about the human mind and uh, I give lectures about it. And uh, the other day I went to MIT to a very interesting program to explore why the press doesn't cover issues of science properly. And there I met a young Chinese woman who was running that program, and I became friends. And she set up just now a group to meet and discuss how to persuade and help reporters and writers to understand science and to communicate it more effectively to the public. That sounds great. That sounds, I'm sure that's exactly what we need. <laughs> Should I continue? Continue. Today, there's an, a, a group of letters to the editor of the New York Times from psychotherapists who complain that they can't get reimbursed for treating emotionally disturbed people with talking therapy. So I didn't write to the editor of the New York Times because they're not receptive to my functional concept of the mind. Instead, I wrote to a woman I met recently who's a leading psychotherapist. And then I added a lot of copies of people. And I said that that reflects the persistent lack of understanding of science writers about the human mind. They don't recognize that Talking therapy is equivalent to prescribing medications. It's a physical activity to influence the operation of the mind. And what happens is that psychotherapists in talking therapy try to identify the type of electrochemical pulse signals within each patient's mind that are disturbing them and causing the emotional distress. Mm -hmm. And then they're trying to figure out how to enable the patients or, or, or clients to devise on themselves counteracting, overcoming batches of pulse signals, or to introduce by the psychotherapist such signals to help overcome the emotional distress. I see. And, and I think that that is the functional operation that occurs that should entitle therapists doing talk therapy to be reimbursed as, as those who prescribe pills. Certainly. So my life <laughs> goes on. <laughs> well, it's very interesting, Roy. I, I must say it's been a wonderful pleasure speaking with you and listening to your story. I think it's a fascinating story, and I think people should hear it. And well, I, I'm so appreciative of the fact that you took the time to tell it. it. It's part of my ego. <laughs> hey, well, welcome to the club. And I, uh, uh, for those of us uh, who don't, don't understand some of these things, like myself, I now have a better understanding. I'm so glad. I mean, I, I, you know, I and, uh, consider that to be my role in life, and uh, I want to make a contribution and broaden it out. Well, I, I must say I'm inspired by the fact now that do something. you are <laughs> doing what you're doing at the yeah. age that you're doing it, because uh, many folks, uh, as we get older, sort of uh, become a couch potato and, and don't continue on with uh, things that are stimulating in life. And you seem to have done well, that Sadly, that's well. what I experience in a retirement community where I live, and that's why I'm so fortunate to have these opportunities to interact outside with the community at large. Wonderful. We've been speaking with Roy Freed of The Roy Freed Show. <laughs> and. Uh, do we have access to the Roy Freed Show online? Or? Uh, it's local in Canton, but it, I think it's on Vimeo for the life of me. I can't quite figure out how to use Vimeo, but people who are smart might be able to get into some of those uh, well, incidents. Well, we'll have a look and see if we can find you. And if you do, if you can help me 
do it easily. I'd appreciate that. I'm doing a little stuff on him. If any of us, I can probably come up with oh, something. Oh, I met the so. right guy, <laughs> as usual. Thank you, Roy Freak. Thank you so it's been much. a real pleasure. Osmond, it's and wonderful. hopefully uh, we can do it again as you as you get uh, new experiences, oh. and uh, I'm sure you will. I can't wait. Okay. But don't forget, I'm 96. <laughs> Look at the famous composer Elliot Carter. Yeah. 103. Yeah. You know, so, well, you know, I'm working. You make me feel young, I'll tell you that. <laughs> That's good. That's a major contribution. <laughs> okay, Roy. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye.